<sighs> okay. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. So you we, too. uh, Kitzah Shechonarach, the abridged code of Jewish law, chapter 92. So we had a week. Just, by the way, does anyone have any questions from last week's class or something that a guest, is there anything that people aren't sure of they wanted to uh, go before we start or? Good to go. All right. So chapter 92, and we're up to uh, number six. Sif Vov, number six. All right. Mish uh, Achoy So someone has high blood pressure, essentially. So Mazikin, uh, sorry, Makizm Oisamiyad. You can straight away put on the leeches and draw blood. So that used to be the treatment. But um, the bottom line is, Whatever someone needs, if they have a dangerously high blood pressure, uh, whatever you need to do on Shabbos, you uh, you do on Shabbos. Although I hear leeches are making a comeback, they're using them for uh, certain conditions again. So um, there we go. Uh, the whole shahik is dam minstani. That someone who had bloodletting, or for that matter, uh, had blood taken or loss of blood, but in other words, they have less blood than they had before. And because of that, now they're feeling cold. The ice the Maduro, this common Philip Thomas Thomas. You can make a fire for him. Never mind, turn on the heater, whatever you need to do. Even in the middle of summer. So um, I thank God I, I have never, I've always had enough blood that I didn't feel cold. But, um, you know, it, it I guess that can be uh, uh, something that can happen if someone starts to lose blood. I, um, right. Number seven. We've got a person that got a pain in both eyes or one of them, and it's um, there's pus, choices, or there's. Um, the tearing, shayadam shayasis, all this blood coming out of his eyes. Uh, so I'm just admitting more people. All this uh, blood coming out of the eyes. Then, um, sorry about that. Just uh, I lost the screen while I was letting people in. Uh, what page are you on? We are in chapter 92, in the middle of number seven. 92. Sadiq Bet? Yes, yeah, Sadiq Bet. Yeah. So, in other words, some type of eye infection, there's a problem with the eye. Now, it's not life threatening to the whole body. I don't show kind of the eye, but or he's got a situation that there's a sakana to the eye. In other words, it's not a life-threatening situation to his entire life. He could live, but there's a danger he will lose the eye or the sight, God forbid. Right? So in that case, Mechalim Allah is a Shabbos. We can be Mechal the Shabbos. We can it override Shabbos, whatever treatments we need to, to give him to keep his, the eyesight or the, you know, to keep the eyes. So we, we mentioned earlier before that a... Um, there's not only life-threatening situation to the body, but this life-threatening situation to a particular limb. Now, if a person, you know, God will lose their hand if we don't do something. Or they, you know, they might be able to live for many years without a hand, you know, but uh, we don't want them to lose their hand. So when there's a, a life-threatening situation to a limb, uh, that also overrides Shabbos. In this case, um, the eye. So when we say teary, I mean, you know, we can... The uh, next to an onion have teary eyes, so we're, we're we're not speaking about that. But when you know when there's a problem, we're worried about some type of eye infection, and that there's um, you know God forbid it's something dangerous to the eye. Okay, number eight, ches. Chaylesh yesh b'shakana, the sarach Now we have a situation 
This person's in a life-threatening situation and what he needs is meat, right? Meat is going to be the cure. The yesh kan bossa osa and the only meat you have available at the moment is non-kosher meat. So we've got, we're going to see there's, there's two, cho- we're going to have two choices here. Choice number one is we can break Shabbos more by shechting an animal and, uh, you know, uh, cutting out the veins or, you know, salting it, all these various things. But then he'll have kosher meat. Or there's non-kosher meat that's readily available. Right? right now you can eat it. So there's less breaking of Shabbos, but there's a problem of kashrus. So which one takes priority? Once right? so we've got a problem either way, uh, but it's a life-threatening situation. We have to do something, but we always want to do the least problematic. So what's the least problematic? So it depends. So we're going to say like this. What we're going to do for most people, we're going to shift new meat and prepare meat from scratch with, with all that extra work that's, that's involved. And we will not give him the non-kosher meat. Because we have a concern. What's the concern? If once he becomes known to him that he's getting this non-kosher meat and this person, you know, has been a good Jewish fellow his whole life and never had non-kosher meat before, then Yaakov's boy, he's going to he's become <coughs> nauseated, right? It's, it's going to distress him. And that can do more damage than good. You know, a, a, a similar law to this that getting too sidetracked, you know, um, someone who's in a dangerous situation and a relative, God forbid, passes away that they would sit shiver for, you know, uh, we don't inform them. All right, so let's give a, a made up example. It doesn't have to be this, but an example of this idea, you know, there were people, God forbid, in a car accident and um, one of the people, unfortunately, did not make it. You should never know from such things. And there's another person who's intensive care. So we don't tell the person who's intensive care that the other person didn't make it because the effect it could have on them, that, God forbid, could cause them to weaken and, uh, you know, put them in a life-threatening situation. Um, so we, we keep the news from them. Um, we don't tell them till, the, till they're well enough. So the similar idea here, we have this person that if he's, he's, he's eaten kosher his whole life, and now we're going to tell him that this food we're giving him is non-kosher meat, then it can, it can make him feel ill, and that'll undo all the benefits of whatever the, the medicine happens to be, the treatment happens to be. So therefore, we'll break Shabbos more, we'll shech the new animal, We'll salt it, we skin it, we do all these things that you normally can't do on Shabbos because that's the treatment this person needs. Avil, however, in a situation where there's no concern that he's going to become nauseated uh, from the concept of non kosher meat, you're going for an example to cotton, it's a small child. He, uh, you know, they, he, he's not really going to understand what's going on. Or should I to or the person is uh, his mind's not here, so unwell, he doesn't know what's going on. Right? So then Machilam Oisabasa Osa, it's better to feed the person the non-kosher meat, when Shikhatim Avurba Shabbos, than to shecht new meat on Shabbos. Right? Because either situation is, is a problem. Life-threatening situation, he needs to have meat, the life-threatening situation overrules anything else but we want to do the smallest amount of wrong things I mean in this case it's right okay, because we're saving his life but even though we're, we're going to do things we normally can't do to save his life we want to keep it to a minimum so again just to summarize 
uh, this person has to have meat in order to survive. It's a life-threatening situation. Only meat is going to make him survive. And we have two choices. Choice number one is we have readily available non-kosher meat. So we can feed the meat. Now, there's a, a problem of the mitzvah of, of keeping kosher. But it's not a breaking Shabbos problem. Or choice number two, we can get kosher meat. So there's no kosher problem. But to get the kosher meat, we're going to have to shech the animal, slaughter it, um, salt it, and the various things in order to prepare it. Because we only have the non-kosher uh, non -kosher meat available. And it has to have one of them. So we want to do the minimum that we can get away with. He must have meat to survive. So we can do, it overrules whatever we need to do, but we want to do as little as possible. So if he's a person who will be repulsed to be nauseated by having the non-kosher meat, so then we'll even shech, we'll slaughter the new, a new animal, we'll salt it, we'll, we'll cut it up, you know, whatever we need, skin it, whatever we need to do to, uh, to give him his food. But if it's someone that, you know, the, the, maybe the, the, you know, the, the mind's not with it, they, they don't know what's going on uh, due to the sickness or it's a small child that doesn't know what's going on, then better to give them the non-kosher food than to do all these uh, acts of breaking Shabbos. And um, although we give an example of meat, I'll be with one, one moment, although we give an example of meat, but... It's, it's a principle, right? So whenever we have two choices and both choices mean this, we're going to do something we couldn't do under normal circumstances. That's a life-threatening situation. We have to take one of the choices. We have to save the person. So we'll go with the choice that's going to create less problems. We'll take, uh, you know, we'll be breaking less things. However, if that would have a negative effect on the person, then we'll go even um, with the choice that will break more things in order to have a better effect, a better healing effect. Yes, Susan. Okay, if the person is uh, not aware of what's going on and the, the, the best thing to do is to give them non-kosher meat and they survive and they're all right and they ask you a month later, did you give me kosher meat? What are you supposed to tell them? Well, if we're in the situation where, where you know, they're, they're not going to be able to handle it, they're still not well, then for sure you don't tell them. Having said that, though, there's probably there's probably no reason to tell someone. You know, uh, and, and I think, right. you know, when, when someone's been rushed into the emergency room and they've, uh, you know, because we're talking about life-threatening situation, they've, they've, they've had whatever treatment they have. I think when they come out of intensive care, I don't think people are really into too many details. Right. And even if they are, you know, you don't need to tell them. You know, right. at the end of the day, though, someone insists, insists, insists. You, you know, you don't need to lie to them. But um, but I don't think there's any benefit. Can you say you don't you don't know? Yes. I mean, it wouldn't be a good idea if the doctor says that. But let me try to explain it from my logic, okay? Please. Susan, because it, it's written in the Shulchan Aruch, then it's not a violation by eating non-kosher food. And a person then needs to accept it because it was, it was prescribed to do that. So there's no guilt and there's no cheating on the person. Okay. It was a way to, to keep them healthy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's true. But he was being that, you know, some people, you can have a negative effect on them psychologically. Whatever. But, but again, if it's the law, that's true. You know, you're, you're subscribing so, by it. But not, not, every, not, not, everyone, not everyone has the, the, the presence of mind to accept that. You know, it just reminds me, there's a, there was a story, there was a, um, a fellow that um, he was in a life threatening situation and the doctor said the only cure he has to have a piece of pig meat every day so he didn't he says no way but the doctor is going to die so he still refuses so they go to the rabbi and the rabbi goes and visits the man and he tells him you know look this is a life-threatening situation when it's life-threatening uh the Torah says 
that this overrules other concerns. So you have to eat it. <clears throat> so the man says, all right, I'll, I'll eat it, but on one condition. Rabbi says, okay, what's the condition? He says, you know, uh, I've my whole life, I only ever ate meat that was shechted. Can you shech the pig for me? He says, all right, if I make you feel better, we'll shech the pig. The main thing is that you, uh, you, you need to eat it. He says, okay, and, and can you salt the meat? I never had meat with the blood in it. So, salt the pig for me. He says, all right. The last thing, Robert, can you check the lungs? Make sure, you know, that the, and, and the other interior organs, make sure there's no problems. Says, fine, fine. Anyway, they shake the pig. They salt it. They cut out all the veins. You know, they, they do all these things. And they inspect the lungs. And there's, uh, there's a hole in one of the lungs. So the fellow brings the rabbi, shows in the pig's lungs, says, Rabbi is a kosher. All right. <laughs> so that's uh, whatever needs to be done gets done. You know, it's, uh, is it only about meat or it has to do with other kosher products? So, yeah, so this, a, a, the, anything and not only food. So although this example was meat, but it, it's a principle. So the principle is you've got two options. One option, um, means breaking less mitzvahs. Okay. Uh, and the other option is breaking more mitzvahs. We'll normally go with the less. We have to, we have to overrule some of the mitzvahs to save his life, but we'll do as few, overrule as few things as possible. However, if by taking that route of, of, the, of, of, of doing less, it's going to make the person... Uh, emotionally or psychologically uh, upset so that's going to affect the treatment you're giving them then we'll even break more to avoid that so um, that's what I was saying even though feeding them you got ready made non-kosher you know meat whatever it happens to be um, and to chef on Shabbos you know now you're doing another five things but if 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 it's going to disturb him Okay, even though, as Robert said, you know, with the halacha says you could have the non kosher, but at the end of the day, if he's going to feel nauseated, it's going to make him, you know, he can't handle it. We'll even break more things to ensure that his treatment is better. Um, what yes. about non kosher medication? There are some. So, so the same thing. Same thing. So it's good, good you ask. I was going to mention that soon after the next one, but we'll. Oh, we'll if, no, that's good. We'll, we'll speak about it now. Um, so medication, there's a lot of things that you could take different options. You know, there's different brands sometimes. So obviously when there's an option, you know, it's, uh, it's not urgent. So if, if, if it's something urgent, a person needs to take something right now, God forbid, otherwise who knows what, then you give them whatever you have available. But, you know, it can be even a serious issue, but you can buy this brand or you can buy that brand. So we will try and go with, something that's kosher. Our next option is we'll take something uh, like in a capsule. So the non-kosher substance doesn't come in direct contact with our mouth. In other words, we're not having any benefit from it. You know, so I will also mention kosher is only a problem to take via the mouth, to inject you know, mm -hmm. like a, or a, a, a transfusion of some sort, uh, all these things, uh, kosher is no issue, right? Kosher is only, only uh, eating. Um, if you can't Rabbi, get some, You yeah. can say you don't benefit from it. You can say we don't enjoy it. Right. Well, that's, a, sorry, correct. That's, that's the benefit I meant. I meant the benefit, more the benefit of eating. So okay. there's two benefits of eating. One benefit is that you, you, you know, it fills you up. And there's the benefit of taste. Right. So, so Robert, within a minute. So for an example, when it comes to a broth on food, let's say um, water. So water doesn't have a taste. Yeah. So if a person is thirsty, so they're getting the benefit of quenching their thirst, then they say a broth on the water. If the person, let's say that to take a, a pill, 
They're not thirsty at all. The only reason they're having a drink right now, a little sip, is to wash the pill down. Then they don't say a bracha because they're not having any benefit from the water. I mean, that you are correct. There's a benefit that it washed the pill down, but there's not an eating benefit. However, if they wash the pill down with orange juice and they like the taste of orange juice, then even though they're not thirsty at this moment, but they're still getting benefit from the taste. So the act of eating is considered either we're benefiting from the taste or we're benefiting, you know, quenched our thirst or hunger. Right? A, a medicinal benefit is not an eating benefit. It's a, it's a side. It just happens to be we put it in our mouth. So if we have some type of caps, you know, some type of medication that has, you know, a plastic capsule type thing on it, and therefore there's no taste. So if we have to have something that's not kosher, that would be our preferred way of taking it. Or, you know, some people um, even sort of wrap it in like in a little um, dissolvable paper type thing. They have a pill, something like that. I mean, a lot of pills don't have a taste, or at least not a nice taste anyway. So, Robert, you want to ask something? Yeah, I guess the question is, you know, in my whole, my whole life, I've never thought of that medicine had to have a hexure on it. And so medicine is medicine. It saves your life. It benefits you. So that's never been a consideration for me. So to a large extent, yes. But again, with the proposal, we, we, we want to do the minimum possible. So if you have another medication that does the exact same job, just as good a job and happens to be kosher, then better to take the kosher one. I guess the question is, is there actually medicine that has hexure on it? Yeah, I mean, so let's say, for example, let's keep it simple. Let's start with vitamins. Yes. Right? Yes. So uh, yeah, vitamins, vitamins and vitamins can medicine. also, yeah, vitamins can yes, also be life-threatening. People can have serious deficiencies, right? So they're pretty much all the vitamins you can get with a, with a, with a hexure. There are lists of medications um, on some of the kosher... Uh, authority, different kosher authorities' uh, websites, um, that things that have been checked out, and where it comes up more often is Pesach. Of koshervitamins.com. Right. But, all vitamins have 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 base, but there's plenty of vitamins, even in regular um, drug stores that, that have a hatch on them. But um, Pesach is when you have the biggest issue um, because there are many uh, medications that are homets. So each year, there's there's different organizations that put out lists of the medications you can have. And obviously you need to consult your, your doctor, you know, is, is exchanging this for, for that good for you? You know, you have to uh, just double check, but off, often there's, there's not an issue or, or sometimes you change to a different company. There's the, how much you take changes slightly, you know, there's, there are things to take into consideration. But um, whenever possible, we want to try and make sure that even the medication, anything goes in our mouth is kosher. Now, if there's not a kosher option, so then it depends what it is. Now, certain things you can do without might be a little less comfortable. Certain things you cannot do without. You have to have it. You know? And again, so we'll, we'll go by medical advice. Um, you know, how essential is it? You know, certain things, let's say, for example, for Pesach, certain things, if you miss a week, is not the end of the world. As long as generally you're taking um, certain things, you miss one day, God forbid, you know, it's like, uh, so it, every situation is going to be different. So whenever possible, any medication we take via the mouth, we want it to be kosher. Uh, if we can't find, then if it's a serious situation, then we'll take whatever we have. But it's, we, we do want to try and find kosher medication if we can. And again, I emphasize this only medication goes by the mouth. Because that's considered an act of eating. Things that we in, inject or, or rub onto the skin um, or other things like that, there's no kosher uh, issue. There could be other issues. So I'll give you an example. Let's say, um, you know, not so much with medications, but just to understand the concept. Um, we know a lot of things are tested on animals, right? So um, I'll give two extremes. 
And obviously life is not black and white, but two extremes will help us understand the principle and then we'll see how it applies in gray areas. So you have certain uh, products that people put on the skin that is really not for health. It's not a medication. It's a, a beauty product or something, you know, makes someone's skin look shinier or whatever it is. And they test that normally on rabbits because they have sensitive skin. So essentially they tortured all these animals for a product that's not a necessity, it's a luxury. So we can't necessarily benefit from, uh, a, from animal torture, right? We are allowed to use animals. The Torah gives us the right, but there's, we have the right to use the world in general. But there's a difference between using the world and abusing the world. Right? Now, the other extreme is there's a medication that would help a lot, potentially help a life-threatening situation uh, that many people have. And before we trial it on people, because although we're not expecting side effects, we believe it's safe, but we don't know, we're going to test it on, you know, whatever, whatever animal. So that we would be allowed to do because a life-threatening situation is going to overrule the potential uh, damage to the animal because it's a life-threatening situation. We want to be the safe lives. The other extreme is just a, a luxury, a beauty product, right? Then you have everything in between. It starts to narrow, you know, when, when does something give a little more quality of life? At what point does it become a luxury as opposed to necessity? You know, we, we would have to look at every case individually. Um, but when it comes to testing something that's important to test, uh, human life is going to overrule the animal life. But when it's not necessary, you know, we, we don't need to do certain things. But is that a, so, um, what about the stem cell situation? Okay, so stem cells, depends where you get them from. So nowadays, they don't usually use stem cells from embryos, right? That's, that, that was originally what they tried to do. You know, till, till about 15 years ago, they used to harvest the stem cells from, um, from embryos. Now, what they used to do, or many clinics, is that they created embryos through IVF, especially to kill and take the stem cells. So halacha would not allow that. Where halacha did allow people to use the stem cells, take from embryos, was for an example, let's say there was a couple who, uh, you know, they, they were having uh, trouble conceiving. And in which case, halakhically, it's, um, you know, there's no problem using IVF. So um, what they'll do is that when they take the, the eggs from the mother, that, you know, they don't want to cut it open 10 times. So for an example, you know, not every place does the same numbers, but on average, let's say they, they took out 12. Took out 12 and they try fertilize all of them. And some work, some don't work, you know, I mean, some people, unfortunately, none of them work, you know, because whatever issue they're having, but, you know, let's say an average is about 50%. So let's say in this case, of the 12, eight worked. No, it's higher than average. Now, they're not going to put eight embryos in the mother at once, because that can lead to other situations. Normally, they don't do more than twins. So they put the rest in the freezer. And, uh, you know, a few years later, she'll take another two. But because she's got eight and they have a limited freezer life, at a certain point, there are going to be some that are not going to make it. Those ones, we could take the stem cells right before um, the expiry date. So in other words, they weren't conceived in order to take the uh, stem cells. They were conceived to try and help this couple have children. Just happened to be, it was more successful than average. And we have these less over ones that are going to die anyway. So then let's try and do something that can help, help other things. So that would be an example. So that, that, that's where they, 
in the in the clinics that were trying to do things halakhically, that was that was where they they did that. Today, um, you know, the, the take from other places, the the, the even the, the the able even to take them um, from people, the, you know, regular sort of, you know, it's not silly as good or, or they they growing them, you know, from some old ones that they had, then they're able to grow grow more. So there's there's there's, there's different things. You know, Thank you. Wonderful yeah. explanation. I really appreciate it. Oh, no problems. I mean, it's it's yeah. So it's it's more the why we do something than necessarily what you know. I, I give give another example. Just the the, the the idea. There's people who want to uh, clone someone. Now, um, maybe it'll work. Maybe it won't work. I mean, I'm sure the technology of being able to create the body will come along. The question is, will that draw down a soul? For it to be living or not? So that we'll have to wait and see, right? When they get the technology, we'll see. Halakhically, in, in concept, there's not a problem with the clone. The side issues, like who is the clone? Is it, is it, uh, is it me? They cloned me. I mean, I don't know why anyone wants more than one of me, one's enough. But let's say they did. So is the clone, is it me? Is it my brother? Is it my son? Is, is it no relation? And, and that would affect, it's all side issues. In other words, uh, if it's, if it's uh, my brother, then there's, you know, can't marry my sister. You know, if it's, if it's is it my son? Does it get inheritance? You know, uh, you know all, all, so it's all sort of side laws that, that are, are the issue. But let's well, say theologically, you know, looking from the, the uh, like just a total perspective, the question is, why are they doing it? So most people doing this research, uh, you know, it's, it's trying, to, trying to make a better soldier or, or they, want to, um, they want to make, uh, you know, uh, not have regular kids anymore. They just want to have, you know, let's just make certain perfect people, you know. So the motive is probably more concerning than, than the ability to do it. Right. That's uh, no. okay. Tess number nine. Mavasha was Shabbos Shul Chayla. We put something on Shabbos for sick person, right? And again, was obviously we're talking about he was sick enough that you're allowed to cook it for him. Needed to have something either the medicine had to be cooked <laughs> to make the medicine, or maybe they had to eat hot food. They had to have soup, whatever it was. So just to digress a little bit to explain the idea, normally we can't cook on Shabbos. It's one of the 39 blockers, one of the, they used to bake showbread in the Mishkan. They would cook the, the various spices, um, you know, to make the, the oil. They were boiled in the, in the oil. So all, all, all these things that they used in the Mishkan to, to build and for the products they used in the Mishkan, that's the 39 creative techniques we can't do on Shabbos. So we can't cook on Shabbos. Now let's say someone did cook. Let's leave a sick person aside now. Someone cooked on Shabbos. So if they cooked on purpose on Shabbos, they knew it was Shabbos, they knew you're not allowed to cook, and they did it anyway. Teach God a lesson to say that I can't cook. Huh? I mean, so that food is forbidden no Jew can eat that ever. Let's say someone, they forgot it was Shabbos, or they forgot you can't cook, or they didn't really know about Shabbos properly. Now, even if perhaps they heard the concept of cooking, but they didn't have a chance to study things about Shabbos, so they don't really know. In other words, they didn't do it deliberately to break Shabbos. It just happened to be they cooked something on Shabbos without properly knowing or understanding the situation. And then they realized before, before you eat it, someone told them or they remembered, you know, whatever happens to be. So since it was not done deliberately, it can still be eaten. However, you can't eat it on Shabbos. And even after Shabbos, you have to wait the time that it takes to make. So let's say this food normally takes an hour to cook. So after Shabbos, you have to wait an hour before you eat it. So you don't get any benefit from the fact it was made on Shabbos. Huh? 
right? So that, um, so someone cooked by accident, they didn't know you can't cook, they bake the cake, takes an hour, they find out before they eat it, or another Jew who, who knows and they want to eat it, um, you have to wait an hour after Shabbos, because it takes an hour to cook, and you don't want to have any benefit from the fact it was cooked on Shabbos. So that's not involving a sick person. In this case, though, they've cooked for a sick person. This person, so they were allowed to cook on Shabbos, because this person is a life-threatening situation. We must give him a hot whatever. Now, we'll just go back to the meat example. I mean, but whatever happens to be. So we cook this meat. That's what he needs to save his life. So it was cooked on Shabbos, but it was cooked on Shabbos in a situation that you're allowed to cook on Shabbos. It was to save someone's life. So, also, Lavari Lachlan Shabbos. A healthy person can't eat any of it on Shabbos. Abel, however, the Maitzi Shabbos, Mutamiyad. After Shabbos, they can eat it immediately after Shabbos. The first second. They don't have to wait the hour that it normally takes to cook. Why? Um, the body, even the healthy person can eat immediately. In Mishlevi Yisrael, if, if it was, you know, it was baked by a Jew, cooked by a Jew, so it's kosher. In other words, since it was cooked in a permissible, it was permissible for it to be cooked on Shabbos, he can eat it immediately after Shabbos. Right? So he can't eat it on Shabbos itself because he's not the sick person. He's a healthy person. But after Shabbos, we don't have to wait that time that we normally have to wait because it was cooked on Shabbos when it was permissible to cook on Shabbos because it was to save a life. Right. We also mentioned that if it was uh, cooked by a Jew. Yeah, Susan. Okay, suppose it's not life-threatening. You're cooking for a sick person who is elderly they're not going to die if they don't eat, but they're going. You're going to maintain their health. So again, so every if somebody's case, ninety it, years old and they need to eat. Yeah, I, I hear. So the question is like this: Even amongst 90, 90 year olds, you have people in better health and not as good health. So it really depends on the situation. So let, let's leave the ninety year old. Let's talk about the diabetic again. It's just a, a simpler example. Now, perhaps they don't need hot foods, but we'll just use that example. With the, let's say, so this person, they have to eat regularly to uh, keep their blood sugar level stable. Now, if they normally eat breakfast at eight, and now they don't eat breakfast at eight, you know, they're not going to drop dead at 8.01. But if you leave at 10, 11, 12, again, depends how severe their condition is. At a certain point, if they got low enough blood sugar level, they fall into a coma, and then etc. So let's use your kip as an example. What we're going to do is we're going to feed them at eight. Even though at eight their life is not in danger, but we know what's going to happen if they don't eat. So it's preventable. So let's go back to your situation. Now, it could be this elderly person um, can eat something that's not cooked, in which case, even though, even though they might prefer hot food, but it's not necessary. So give them something that's not cooked. But if there was somebody, you know, they, they, they had to have something that was freshly prepared, it loses its effect if it's not, whatever it is, if it needed to be done, um, even if it means they're not gonna drop dead that second, right? But they're gonna need it sometime over Shabbos, then you will be allowed to. However, if we could get away with not doing on Shabbos, we fed them something else, and we give them a hot food immediately after Shabbos, then we're going to do that. But each case has to be looked at its own merits. So in what, whatever's necessary, or even possibly necessary. So let's say um, they're not for sure going to drop dead, God forbid, but, but it, it could do. You know, it's, uh, you know, uh, we mess things up, it could, it could, there's potential to be life threatening problems, then we're always going to err on the side of caution. So, uh, in a situation though where we can cook for this person, this person needs 
something cooked on Shabbos, then it was cooked in a permissible way, even though normally cooking is not allowed on Shabbos. So the healthy person can't have any of it on Shabbos. They don't need it. But after Shabbos, we don't have to wait that penalty time uh, that's normally if somebody got cooked on Shabbos because when this item was cooked on Shabbos, it was allowed to be cooked. Okay, I'm sorry if I was a little long-winded. Sometimes I feel like, uh, you know, I'm- I, no, no, I, I, I understand why, why, now I can understand better what you're talking about. Okay. All right. Can I, ask, can I ask you, Please. when do you consider the end of Friday, you know, I know that it's certain time when you kindle, when you put the, the light, the candles, yeah. but you, you know, because it's a little bit not settled, where is exactly the, the board yeah. line on Saturday when the Shabbos actually ended? Okay, so so on, on Friday, mm -hmm. Shabbos comes in effect at sunset and okay. that's gonna change from time to time and place to place. And it's going to end at, at nightfall. Now, nightfall is, you know, we loosely call it when three average size stars come out. But in a city, you actually see the stars later because of all the all the lights. And I was, it's the end. So Shabbos begins at the beginning of twilight and it ends at the end of twilight when it's fully night. And again, there's going to change um, various times of the year. Is it basically 24 hours? From so the no, it'll end up being closer to 25. 25. Because, because we're going the beginning of, of twilight to the end of twilight. But again, it, that also depends where you live. Because there are, there are places that have a very short twilight. Because where they are, you know, close to the North Pole or, you know, or further, you know, the places that have a longer twilight. So, um, you know, in Phoenix, twilight's around about 44 minutes. Um, but but I know there's places in Europe that have 70, it's, there's 72 minutes. Depends, you know, where you are in the, in, on the globe. So, is it uh, any indications? What exactly time is it? Can you find in the Jewish calendar? Or yeah, so, so, in, so in, in the Jewish calendar, they normally have the time Shabbos begins, which is normal, can, normally they have candle lighting. So candle lighting is 18 minutes earlier. Right, we try and light earlier because this avoids, you know, if you uh, make a mistake or get distracted for a minute or two, <laughs> you've got a bit of leeway. Okay. So, uh, so the, the, the twilight begins 18 minutes after the candle light. So when you light candles, you should bring Shabbos in early. But, you know, if there's a situation, God forbid, then those 18 minutes are technically uh, not Shabbos then the time that they have in the calendar should normally say in the calendar where it ends. Another good resource is Chabad.org. And you can, you can set it to your uh, zip code, you know, and it-, and it yeah, I do have it. I do yeah. have it. Okay. So it, it'll, it'll tell Thank you. you. Thank you. No problems. Okay, number 10. Okay, now. Now we're leaving the situation of um, illness. So the last one is someone's being forced to break Shabbos for another reason. So I did give this example before, but um, you know, maybe a month ago we started, but just again to uh, help us have some perspective. There are times where we, we've had forced conversions in Jewish history, you know, people, you know, convert or die or something, you know, God forbid, or, or they just grab people and baptize them against it. They, they didn't even give them the option to die. They just, and, and, and now they're officially, they're Christians. And if they don't keep uh, everything, they get burnt at the stake. Now that's, uh, we, we, we've had that in history, unfortunately. So there was a time in Roman periods, Roman period where the Jews wore black shoelaces and the Romans wore purple shoelaces. And it was at a point where you person was instructed to give up their life rather than change the shoelaces, right? Which is normally not something you have to give your life up for. But that became like the image, that became like the, the line in the sand. If you change your shoelaces, you're not Jewish anymore. You know, so 
There are times where someone comes and does something particularly to take a Jew away from Judaism. Then there's another case. You know, he's got this guy walking home from Shul and Shabbos, happens to walk by the bank, and bank robbers come running out of the bank, and they put the gun, they say to him, drive the car, <laughs> the getaway car. It's got nothing to do with him being Jewish. It just happened to be he was in the wrong place at the wrong time, right? And they want him to drive the car, or they're going to shoot him off of it. So then he should drive the car because it's 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 not attack on his. It's not they're not trying to convert him. They're just uh, uh, you know, they, they, it's nothing to do with with Shabbos or Judaism. It's just the circumstances of they need to get away driver. Um, I'm not suggesting that's a career anyone should go into, by the way. Drive and get away cars, but you know, just an example. So, number 10. Someone is being forced to transgress a serious um, avera, even momentarily. So, when we say serious, we mean to say idolatry. Right, they're saying, um, you know, they, they want him to do uh, something like that. So, a fellow she avera chamura en machama lav shabbos, then la tzila min avera. Now, even if it's the serious, um, the serious transgression, we are not going to break shabbos to save him from doing it. So let's give an example. They, um, they are going to force this person to bow down to the idol. You know, it's pretty serious. Now, you could get in the, uh, the military vehicle, uh, drive over there, uh, come with your machine guns, and, uh, you know, whatever and and stop him from so they're not going to kill him but right? they're just going to force him to bow down so we're not going to break shabbos to save him from that situation okay if they're going to kill him it's different right but here the the his life's not at risk it's just a very serious i won't say just but it, it's it's a very serious uh, breach of his judaism so we're not going to break Shabbos to save him from that. Abel, however, if they want to take him out of his Judaism, so they're not just telling him just to bow down now, and then they let him go. You know, you bow down one minute, they're forced to bow down, and then they let him go. Here in this case, they, uh, they want to baptize him. And once he's baptized, uh, he has to never be Jewish again, or they burn him at the stake, you know, the uh, Inquisition's after him. So they want to do that, the Hotsiyah Makhali Israel, to take him away. He's, no, he's not going to be a Jew anymore. Right? Um, I apologize. One second. I've just got to open the door for someone. One second. Go My apologies. So, if it's only momentarily, they're forcing him bow now, then they let him go. That we're not going to make Shabbos. For. But if they're going to take him away from being a Jew, he, I mean, obviously a Jew is always a Jew, but he won't be able to live as a Jew anymore. I feel a cotton a katana, even if it's only a small child, a little boy, a little girl. I hear who I'll call Mishviyadoi. There's an obligation on whoever has the ability to do whatever they need to do to save them. All right, so uh, we'll take up the arms, we'll carry them in a public domain, uh, we'll shoot weapons if need be, whatever it is, drive the Hummer or the helicopter, um, whatever happens to be. Now, I feel Shabbos 
This is even if we, to save this person, we are going to break Torah prohibitions. It's not only rabbinic, even Torah prohibitions. We're going to do absolute breaking of Shabbos. We get the exact same rules that apply to saving a sick person who is in a life-threatening situation. We are going to apply to save this person from their spiritual life-threatening situation. Right? We have to guard, the Jews have to guard to keep Shabbos properly. So I'm going to tell you, so why are we allowed to break Shabbos to save a sick person? Because the Torah says, We're going to break one Shabbos to save this person's life so they can keep many Shabbos. Okay, now this doesn't mean uh, that now all of a sudden we can do something once because we've got to, you know, the, the ends don't justify the means. It doesn't mean we can do whatever you like. We're talking about in a life threatening situation. Even when it comes to save someone's life, even, it, you know, we don't know for sure you're going to save his life. The person's, God forbid, having a heart attack. You know, you're going to call the ambulance. Uh, you know, maybe they're going to save him. Maybe they're not going to save him. You know, you, you, even though you don't know for sure you're going to save him. It's just a possibility. We can't mock him nevertheless. We're obligated, not we're allowed to. It's not only we're allowed to, we're obligated to break Shabbos, the Shtad of the Efshan, do whatever as much as possible to, to save this person. So, this person who's been stolen from Judaism, been forcibly taken out of Judaism, we have an obligation to save them, even if we don't know we're going to be successful. We do whatever we would do, exactly the same for a possible life-threatening situation. As long as there's a chance, a reasonable chance of saving them, we can do pretty much anything. Try and save a person in that situation. So that's someone who's being forced. And unfortunately, this happened in, in history, many times in history. Um, we can do whatever we can do, even though it means breaking Shabbos, to save them. If they're being forced. Avil, however, Misha Pasha Baroitzlahamir. You have someone he wants, you know, he's uh he's gone off to get a baptism himself. He wants to uh, uh worship the idol. Right? For him, we're not going to break Torah prohibitions to save him because he's actively trying to do it. So at a certain point, you can't, you know, you can't stop the person. So in that situation, Torah prohibitions aren't overruled. They came with the Pasha because he's, he's doing it deliberately. You know, you can't, you, you know, you, you, you're not going to lock him up forever. You know, what, what are you going to do? You know, we, 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 we can't be careful. We don't say that that a person should do something to save him. We can't mock him. This is the Rabon. However, a rabbinic prohibition, we will break to try and save this person. You're going, for example, Lechas Chutz Tchum. You mentioned the Tchum. There's a limit to how far you can go outside uh, settled areas. So let's say you have to go further to try and speak with him, to have him change his mind. So you can walk further than the tchum. The Rik of Agabi Sus, you can ride on a horse. Right? Riding horses are a rabbinic um, uh, prohibition. Or Lailith Bagala, or to go on a horse-drawn wagon. Right? This is not a car. A car is is uh, has Torah prohibitions. But to go on a horse-drawn wagon is the same as riding the horse. The Khan of Talta Mois Gadoima, or where there's an aid of to carry money, you know, to uh, maybe go to bribe someone. Um, so you could do that. Then we're allowed to break these rabbinic prohibitions to try and save him from uh, leaving the Jewish people. Um, yes, Robert. I, I, 
thought I understood that even though or even if somebody decides to convert outside of Judaism, he's still considered a Jew within Judaism, within yes. the religion. Yes, they are still Jewish. Of course. When we say they're going to leave the Jewish people, I mean, at the end of the day, once someone's born a Jew, they're always a Jew. Yes. Nevertheless, once they take that step, practically speaking, they're not going to be able to keep Judaism. So... Um, and it's then it's their, their choice to come back if they do want to. Well, it is their choice, but in, in many times in history, once someone became uh, something else, it was a death penalty to come back. So, okay. you know, there's, there's uh, or even if the, the, the government or the law is not preventing them, you know, once someone makes a step like that, um, you know, we never give up on them. And we're going to never say never, but it's very hard to bring people back. Um, difficult situation. Right. Okay, so we'll start the uh, next chapter. Unless we have any, any, any more questions. Okay, so chapter 93. <laughs> Dina Yoledis Bashabas. Right, the laws of childbirth on Shabbos. Aleph number one. Miyaj Hilo the Isha Lahagish Smini Laidam. Immediately when a person goes, uh, you know, the little translation has the signs of birth. So we don't mean the small uh, pre-contractions, but when when it gets going. Right, as soon as it gets serious. I feel he must have focus, even if she's in doubt, whether you know not, you're not 100 percent sure, like you think it's happening, but you're not 100 percent sure yet. You can call the a midwife. Oh, that's what they used to do then. Some people still have midwife come to the house. But, you know, some people go to the hospital to the midwife. But whatever it works, whatever the person's doing, um, because we're going to say, and I'll just say the first sentence of number two, because it's going to give us a definition. We look at a person, a lady in childbirth, as a sick person where there's a life-threatening situation. Now, although for thousands of years, women have given birth, Baruch Hashem, but um, there can be complications. So just to go on a, on a tangent, uh, the mitzvah to have children is only given to men. Right? So uh, you're probably wondering how does that work? Because normally men can't have children on their own. Right? It needs to have uh, women involved. So women are encouraged to have children, obviously. But the obligation have children is only given to men. Why? Because for a man to have a child, there's no danger to themselves. Uh, you know, uh, we, don't, we don't want to make childbirth sound, you know, over scary, but at, at a, it, it is a time where there's uh, potential uh, risks. So since it can be dangerous, therefore the women aren't commanded. They don't feel comfortable or after taking, I mean, where there's a medical situation, you know, sometimes uh, even though we don't do abortion in, in Judaism normally, but if there comes a situation where we see there's a danger to the, the mother's life, uh, mm -hmm. then the mother is already a person. The fetus is a potential person. So her life is going to take priority. So there are times uh, where we would do an abortion. But even a regular healthy birth, you know, uh, you know, God forbid, you know, there can be uh, complications. You know, there's uh, there's less complications today. You know, we're after our seventh child, um, my wife had some hemorrhaging. Uh, you know, uh, the midwife just gave her a pill that stopped it. I'm, I'm not even sure what it was, but it pretty much stopped, you know, within half an hour. It was just pretty much straight away. 
And, you know, they kept in hospital overnight just to, uh, as an ob observation. But it was all good, you know, but God forbid, you know, 50 years ago, whatever it was, before they had developed that medication, you know, there's, uh, so we, we, we look at a lady in childbirth as a, someone that has potential life threatening situation. So whatever we can do for, so if we would normally call an ambulance or we need to uh, take her somewhere in a car or whatever we need to do to uh, ensure her safety, that's what we're gonna be allowed to do on Shabbos. And next week, we'll go into the details a little bit more. It's not exactly, uh, not everything we're gonna say is exactly the regular practice today because uh, Baruch Hashem, the medical profession has um, made steps forward, but we'll get the principles. Okay. All right. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Good Rabbi. session. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. Bye-bye, everyone. Have an amazing week. Beautiful Shabbos. Thank you. Thank you. Good Shabbos. Bye-bye. Take care.